Boy, what a wonderful way to begin our time of worship and celebration together on this homecoming Sunday. I am so glad that you are here with us. Let me say welcome. Welcome to each and every one of you, whether you're a part of our church family on a regular weekly basis, whether you're visiting with us this morning, uh, whether you are here occasionally, uh, all of the above, you are a very special part of our church family today. And there will be those who will be listening and watching, uh, perhaps even from a great distance. So we want to be mindful and prayerful for all of our church family, whether uh, in this space right here or maybe even a great distance away. What a joy it is to celebrate celebrate, to worship. You guys look great. You sound great. And I mean every one of you. I was just hoping somebody would uh, say the same. But I, anyway, that's okay. I'm just picking. I'm just picking. I'm just so glad. And I tell you, isn't it? Now, that, now I tell you something that's exciting. And y'all have known me long enough now, almost three years, to know how much I love music. Isn't it good to have the choir back in the choir loft again? That's been a while. And I am so glad we are, we are so, I'm so grateful for all the music team that have been working feverishly over the last several days uh, to, to prepare, uh, to lead us in a time of worship, not just this morning, but tonight and through Wednesday night as well. Yes, we'll begin uh, a very focused attention, praying for, celebrating, trusting God to bring us into a time of revival right here in our own lives, in our church, in our community as well. want you to be a part of that. But before that, great, uh, great blessings that you'll have a chance to be a part of this morning already. Joey and Jerry, uh, thank you for leading us and continuing to do so. Uh, they've been a part of, of this family here long before I was, and you know them. You could probably tell me more stories about them uh, than I could. I was going to say uh, we might need to postpone that for, for a later time. But you are, you're in for a treat, obviously, as we, as we worship together. Uh, but I'm glad that you are going to have the privilege in the next several days to get to know a very, very close friend of mine from, from way back in the day, back in the 80s, uh, when we first uh, came to know each other as, as friends and, and, and college classmates and, and really family. Jamie Pruitt, who is currently the pastor of the Gillum Springs Baptist Church in Arab, Alabama, been there for 10 years, is that right? So uh, what, a, what a joy, what a blessing uh, that they have had. And as, as the Lord has, has grown uh, their family in those days, grown the ministry in those days, uh, Jamie is a very, very dear friend. His wife was one of uh, Michelle's college roommates, so they are very much like uh, sisters and have been uh, since those days and continue to be so. So I, I'm excited about uh, you getting to know and uh, not only him as, as a friend of mine, but as a, as a man who loves the Lord and, and loves to preach the word, uh, loves prayer, loves revival, loves missions. And you will hear all of that and a whole lot more. Uh, in the days ahead. But let me remind you of just a couple of quick things, uh, especially you've probably heard some of this and you see some of that right here. It's time to be getting our shoe boxes, filling those up, bringing those back. Literally in just a few weeks, it'll be time to bring those back and box those up and ship those off. Uh, we're also uh, began. Last week, our World Hunger Emphasis in the foyer, either of the, the main foyers, grab you one of these, fill it up, bring it back. Uh, it can take, uh, you say, it's really good just for your change at the end of every day. Don't put it in that uh, pocket in your car, you know, for that, for that milkshake that you really don't need if you're like me. Put it in here for the next two or three months. We'll be collecting this through January, compiling that, sending that in. Uh, also, uh, and I didn't, really, I didn't plan this, this is, this is exciting, you saw this, you got a bulletin this morning, today actually begins week of prayer for associational missions as well, and what a blessing it is to have our uh, uh, associational missionary, director of missions, associational mission strategist, uh, you know, just whatever you want to call him, uh, and if there's anything else, that's just up to you, and you can take care of that later, but I am so glad to have Joey with us here uh, as a reminder of the importance of the association, churches, Southern Baptist churches cooperating together in missions and ministry, uh, so as we pray here in just a moment, we pray for all of these, uh, but especially for our association and for the churches across Across our association and across our state in these days. So let's do that. There are a lot of other things I want you to make sure you see and you know about. Make sure you look in your bulletin for schedules and upcoming events as well. But let's pray. Let's thank the Lord for this day, but also for His presence and His work in us and through us as we worship together today. 
Heavenly Father, what a joy, what an amazing privilege it is to be a part of this time and this, this celebration today. Lord, we, we call a day like this homecoming, uh, and it is, and it has been for generations of time, maybe when others uh, who have been away would come back. And, and I realize that as the generations change, that's not always a, a, an, an exciting, uh, attractive thought. But Lord, if nothing else, I pray that this day and the celebration and the fellowship together would build within us an anticipation for that homecoming one day when we will see you face to face. For truly that is uh, the greatest homecoming that we could ever imagine. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we'll one day be able to be a part of. So I pray today that as we worship, as we celebrate, as we fellowship together this morning and tonight and in the days ahead, that it will be a time where we are drawn near to you, to your heart, to your word, to your will. Lord, speak to our hearts through your servants, your messengers that you have sent to us. Thank you so much for each one. And I thank you for each one who is here today, those that may be listening, those that are watching as well. And I pray that you would speak and that you would work very personally within each heart and each life. As we've come from many different places with many different needs, yet you are aware of each one. And your word is very applicable to each of our lives and each of our circumstances. So you, you be glorified and you be honored through all of this today. Uh, Lord, it's, 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 more than, it's more than a performance. It's more than just preaching. It is, it is for your glory and for your honor. It is, the, it is the lifting high of the name of Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, our hope and our salvation. And we do that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Jamie Pruitt, and uh, I am truly honored to be here at this wonderful church with these wonderful friends that indeed we have been friends for a number of years. Um, we survived college together, and uh, Mark has not changed a bit since college. I, however, have expanded my ministry in ways that we will not talk about nor will I button my jacket because these young people up here, if that button goes, they're going blind. It's going to put out an eye. So it's just me and all my glory this morning. Are y'all doing well? Are y'all glad to be here? Have you got your Bibles? Why don't you turn to John chapter 11, and I'm going to preach. Uh, a lot of times when you're invited to preach, you're not really sure what to preach. You're not, you're not sure where the church is, what's going on in the church, but Mark commented on this sermon, and he said, I, I wish you would preach that when you come. So that helped me. A lot of times I feel like you may have heard about the new young Indian chief. You've probably heard about him. He was young. The old chief died, and so the tribe got together, and they said, we've got to choose a new chief. And so there was this movement to get a younger chief. You know, that's the thing to do. We're going to age down this thing. So they, they elected a new young chief, and he was young. He didn't know what to do. And the Indian said, chief, what should we do? He had no clue. So it just came to his mind. He said, I'll tell you what, winter's coming. Why don't y'all chop wood? So the Indians went out and they started chopping wood. He felt guilty. He said, I don't know if it's going to be cold this winter. So being young... He got on his phone, he got on an app, and he started looking, and sure enough, yeah, it's going to be cold. So he, he was feeling just a little bit nervous about that, though, so he went into town to talk to the meteorologist. He said, can y'all tell me if it's going to be cold this winter? And the meteorologist said, we believe it's going to be cold this winter. He said, good. He goes back to the reservation, and the Indians have cut wood, and they said, okay, chief, we cut wood. What do we do now? And he didn't know what to do, so he just said, I tell you what, go cut more firewood. They went out and cut more firewood. He's still feeling bad. So he goes back into town for a second time, and he says to the meteorologist, he said, guys, I really need to know, do you think it's going to be cold this winter? And they said, we think early indications are this could be a very cold winter. He said, good. He goes back to the reservation. They've cut more wood. He said, all right, now, what do we do now, chief? He said, go cut more firewood. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. They go out, they start cutting more firewood. He goes back to the meteorologist. He said, guys, I need y'all to tell me, is it going to be cold this winter? They said, chief, we think this could be the coldest 
winter we have ever had. He said, how do y'all know that? They said, the Indians are cutting firewood like crazy. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like that young Indian chief. I'm not sure what to say, but your beloved pastor said, I wish y'all would preach this message. So y'all have got your Bibles. Now, when I ask a question, y'all need to respond. Y'all got your Bibles? John chapter 11. We're not going to look at the whole chapter, I promise you. And I'm going to set a timer because it's already come to my attention. Your pastor may preach longer than I normally do. So look, I've got a timer. When that goes past 30 minutes, it explodes. That's a lie. It doesn't really do that. Don't get excited. But it's an encouragement to me, and I hope that's an encouragement to you all. I see you nodding your head back there. Third, uh, uh, listen, set me free. All right, John chapter 11, let's just sort of survey through the first 28 verses, and then I'll get to my message. So look with me, John chapter 1, uh, excuse me, John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed then two days longer in the place where he was. Paul's right there. And let me set up for you what I think the context of John chapter 11 is all about. And it is about two things. It's about life. And it's about lordship. And those are two things you and I have to deal with every single day. We have to deal with life. Well, when you read these first few verses, you get a glimpse into the life of Jesus. We are told some things about relationships that Jesus had. He loved Mary, and he loved Martha, and he loved Lazarus, and one of them is sick. And he knew that sickness would lead to death. That is life. You and I deal with life every single day. But this passage is not just about life. It's also about lordship. We get a we get a hint of that as we move forward, so go with me to verse 17, all right? Y'all still got your Bibles? Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now, let me just pause right there. The reason why that is significant and the reason why we will read the response we'll read in just a few minutes is that there was a Jewish tradition Yea, even, don't I sound like a preacher when I say yea, even? Yea, even, there was a belief that the soul of humanity would hover over a body for four days. But on the fourth day, if that soul could not reunite with that body, then that person was really dead. That's why we read four days, okay? So keep that in mind. So when he came, he found that he'd already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Why is that important? Well, you're going to hear it just a little bit. You know, these sisters are kind of put out with Jesus. Y'all remember the story? Lord, if you'd been here, we're, we're going to read it. He wasn't that far away. It was two miles. And in that day, it was nothing to walk two miles. If I had to walk two miles, I wouldn't get there till next week. But two miles was nothing in that day. And so it was just two miles that he had to go. And so look at verse 19. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. That's just like Mary and Martha. Martha was the busy one. Martha was the one who was not always content to sit at the feet of Jesus. She had to be moving, she had to be working, and she also had to say something. Now, there's usually a Mary and a Martha in every church. Do not look around. Do not point. 
But there's usually a Mary and a Martha. Martha gets a bad rap that I think she doesn't deserve. She was created just as God wanted her to be. And so she heard Jesus was coming near. She's not going to wait on him. What does she do? She gets up and runs out, and she's going to confront him because there's always one. <laughs> right? There's always one that's willing to confront. Now, if you can't figure out who that is in this church, that might be you. But anyway, we won't go there, okay? Look at verse 20. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary still sat in the house. And Martha, therefore, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Now, this is where for me it gets very interesting. This is where we're moving from life and, and, and life that happens and how we respond to it. This is where we're moving into the lordship issue. Because Jesus is really getting down to the meat of some things here. It's a quick transition. She says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha states something that she believes. She states something that is almost what you and I could call a doctrine. So, something that we really do think, but Jesus wants to take her to the next level. This is where I think we're beginning to get a hint about lordship because Jesus said to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He was moving her from something that she really knew in her head to something she believed in her heart. And that's always been what was required with Jesus. I'm convinced, and you've heard it before, I'm not the first one to ever say this. There are people, sadly, who've gone to hell because of an 18-inch problem. They never got something from head knowledge to heart belief. And so Jesus is trying to make sure, Martha, you don't just have this in your head, you've got this in your heart. That's why I think this passage is not just about life, but also about lordship. And she said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. She tells him who he is, what he is, and what he is doing. So that's a wonderful place for Martha to be. But very quickly, before my phone explodes, y'all look with me at verse 28. The Bible says, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him and Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary is expressing Faith. Martha has expressed faith already in response to his direct question. Do you believe this? Now Jesus is calling for Mary. And so Martha facilitates Mary knowing that Jesus is looking for her. And Mary's response is a lot like that of Martha's. She has regret. She has frustration. She has grief. She has anger. She's like any of us when you and I are facing the death of a loved one, just a big wad of emotions. And she says, Lord, if you'd been here, things would have been different. You could have done something. 
And Jesus saw her weeping, verse 33. Y'all still reading your Bibles? Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. That short verse we can always remember. Y'all remember those days when you're just learning scripture? What's your favorite verse? Jesus wept. That's a lie. That's not our favorite verse, but it's one we can remember, right? Those of us that were not magna cum laude graduates in college, like y'all. I graduated, thank you, laude. But anyway, (laughs) Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them also said, listen to this, some of them also said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Here's a glimpse into the humanity of Jesus. We're told that he sees Mary weeping. We're told he sees others that are weeping. Now, the word that's used here in reference to how Jesus responds, it's an old verb. Now, everything in the Greek New Testament is an old word, but this is an old verb, not used frequently in the Bible. It meant to snort like a horse. Now, some folks hear that, and they're a little bit offended that we would ever say Jesus did something like that. It was used of violent displeasure. It was used of indignation. And some people read this and say, Jesus is angry at the way the crowd is acting. Now, my wife grew up in the Middle East. We lived in the Middle East briefly. In the Middle East, if you are grieving, you grieve loudly. You wail. If you really want to impress people when a loved one dies, you'll hire people to come to the funeral to wail even louder. You can see this on the news. Anytime they're reporting on something that's happened in the Middle East, if someone's been killed, you will see people in the background wailing. Some scholars say that's what Jesus was responding to. He didn't appreciate the fact that the Jews showed up and they were wailing like this. No, I don't think that's what was going on because it also says that Jesus was greatly troubled. It means to cause mental distress. It's from an old word that means to agitate. Now, have any of y'all bought a washing machine lately? They don't have that big part in the middle. Did y'all know that? Y'all, y'all know what washing machines are? Okay, so if I ask a question, it's okay to say, yeah, we know what you're talking about. I'm not the only one in here that washes my clothes, right? Right? Y'all remember those old washing machines that had that thing in the middle that did like this and it'd go around like that? That was called a what? Agitator. They've taken them out. We don't agitate our clothes anymore. <laughs> Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Anyway, <laughs> the Bible says that Jesus was stirred up, that he was troubled, that he was agitated. Now, let me just go a little bit further. I don't buy the fact that the actions of what was culturally and socially acceptable were really what stirred Jesus up. I think Jesus was agitated. I think he was stirred up. I think he was grieving truly over the effects of sin in this world. Because listen to what John Calvin says of this passage. John Calvin, the old reformer, said, Christ does not come to the sepulcher as an idle spectator. But like a wrestler preparing for the contest, therefore no wonder that he groans again for the violent tyranny of death, which he had to overcome, stands before his eyes. I think Jesus was agitated, worked up, snorting, and moved emotionally because he saw the effects of sin on people that he loved. They were grieving, and they were hurting, and someone Jesus loved has died. 
And I believe that's why we then read these nine letters, two words, Jesus the God-man does something that you and I and all of us have done. He cried. Now, Jesus weeping, the word that's used there is just to have a a quiet weep, a quiet cry. And it shows that he loves Lazarus. It puts the focus on his friendship and his relationship with Lazarus. And Jesus himself was doing what Paul told the church at Rome, you and I are supposed to do. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says that we rejoice with those who rejoice, but we weep with those who weep. This tender moment, though, is not without some minor conflict. Some in the crowd, did you see it? They said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Now, is that concern or is that complaint? I'm not sure. But isn't that life also? Where some folks will experience something and one response will be this and another response will be that. And Charles Spurgeon said about this that what the crowd did was not helpful. He said perhaps the bitterest griefs that men know come not from facts but from things which might have been as they imagine. That is to say, they dig wells of supposition and drink the brackish waters of regret. But Jesus isn't finished. And those who are questioning, could this man who opened the eyes of the blind not have kept this man from dying? They're going to see something wonderful. You still have your Bibles? Good. Go with me to verse 38. Verse 38, if I can find it in my Bible, I'll read it with you. I speak the things which I have said. Then Jesus deeply moved again. My Bible turned pages on me. Y'all ever do that? Have y'all ever, have y'all ever preached and your Bible turned pages on you? It's like, it's like that preacher, this is not in my notes. It's like that preacher who was preaching on Noah. And he said, then Noah took his wife and he flipped what he thought was one page, but he flipped to it and he said she was 60 cubits tall, 60 cubits wide. (laughs) Anyway, y'all get the idea. Verse 11, verse 38, my ADD comes out while I'm preaching better than any other time. Jesus, therefore, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. And Martha... The sister of the deceased, the one who always had something to say, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. If you will remember, that man in Jewish culture, he's dead. He's really dead. There's no hope anymore. He's been there four days. And Jesus said to her, verse 40, Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hearest me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people standing around, I said it that they may believe that thou didst send me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, And his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now Jesus had previously asked where they had laid him. And so he came to the tomb and we're told it was a a cave with a stone. And Jesus said, take away the stone. There's resistance. Martha says, Lord, you know he's dead. Four days he's in the tomb. It's a little bit of me who's just a little bit amused that those who really wanted Jesus to come and do something when he comes and says he's going to do something they push back but in that human nature Jesus clarifies didn't I tell you Uh, that to me is this issue of belief and lordship Jesus says belief is required to see the glory of God now understand Jesus can perform miracles regardless of the level of belief in any crowd 
But his ability was not limited by this family. But we are told that without belief, Martha would not see the glory of God. But she had belief. She had said, yes, I believe. I believe you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Therefore, Jesus cries out, Lazarus. Now, you've heard it before. Preachers going back as far as D.L. Moody have said that if Jesus did not specify Lazarus by name, all the graves would have been emptied. A.W. Pink said it this way. Lazarus was addressed personally. For as it had been well remarked, had Christ simply cried, come forth, Hades would have been emptied, and every tenant of the grave would have been raised from the dead. We have here in miniature what will take place on the resurrection morn. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And so Jesus cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And he who was dead was dead no more. Jesus says simply, unbind him. Let him go. Walter Kaiser, the great Old Testament professor, said these are the favorite words for churches, for their pastors on Sunday morning. Unbind us. Let us go. And I'm going to let you go in nine minutes and 15 seconds. All of that was the introduction. Here's my sermon. Are y'all ready? I want to tell you three things that I know absolutely today. Three things like every good preacher ought to. Three things. No poem, just three things. And the first one is, is that some of you are dead. The harsh reality on every Sunday morning in every church building across this land and around the world, there is the likelihood that someone here today is dead in your sin, entombed in fear of walking out alive at the call of Jesus. You cling to the perceived safety of appearing to be a Christ follower, but you know you've never fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. You know it but you're scared of what others will say. And so my question to you today is, don't you, won't you realize that the way to life eternal is the first step towards Jesus who has called your name and yet week in and week out you ignore it. So many of us are uncomfortable with death. Let me tell you what, all of us in this room either are or were dead. Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in the trespasses and sins. You will go on to verse 4 and 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Some of you today are dead. The second thing I would say is that Some of you here are not dead. You're alive, but you're still bound. You can't fully enjoy the freedom of being alive because something or someone has you bound. I don't know what it is. I think it's different from person to person. For some, it's guilt. For some, it's a besetting sin which so easily entangles. For some, it's an unhealthy relationship. For some, it's A love of traditionalism. For some, it's a struggle to measure up to someone's perceived standards. Lazarus had to have help to be unbound. And there are times when we all need help. And if that's you, you know it. And you know what it is that has you bound. Call your pastor. Call a friend. Call someone you trust because Jesus didn't expect Lazarus to go home with reminders of his death. He wanted nothing to bind him. And Jesus' goal is that those who've been made alive actually be set free. They be loose. They be unbound. That the remnants of death have no place in life. So I know that some here today are dead. I know some here today are alive but have been set free. And the third thing I know is that Jesus is calling. When he calls, you know it's him. 
When you hear him, you know it. It's a distinct voice. People always want to know, is it audible? And I say, no, it's louder than that. You can't get away from the Lord's call on your life. And if it's you he's calling specifically today, that unease, those sweat beads, that nervous tummy, whatever you want to call it, it is the Lord calling. James Hamilton was a Nazarene pastor. He went on to be a professor of counseling at a Nazarene college. He wrote a book called Directions. He tells the story of a man in an ice house. Long years ago, we used to have to go to the ice house to get our ice. Our refrigerators didn't make it for us, and we didn't push the little lever on the door to get all the ice we want. The man lost his watch, and in that day at the ice house, watches were not disposable. Watches were things you bought and kept. Watches were things you maintained. Watches were things you passed from generation to generation. And he lost his watch, and it broke his heart. And at the end of the day, there was a little boy that used to sort of help out in the ice house. And when everybody had gone, he went and found that man's watch. The next day, he brought it to him, and he said, I've got your watch. He said, my word, son, I looked for that thing all day yesterday. How did you find it? He said, when everybody was gone, I shut every door, and I put my head to the floor, and I heard that ticking. Now, let me tell you what. Every single time the gospel is preached, there'll be a distraction. Did you notice this moment almost as if on cue? When we come to the heart of the moment for decision, what happened? Satan created a distraction. I'm telling you, I know three things. I know some here today are dead. I know some of you here are alive, but you're bound. You're not enjoying the freedom Christ has for you. And the third thing I know for certain is that Jesus is calling And so as you celebrate a homecoming and as we pray for a revival in our lives, friend, I want to tell you, you can't revive what's never been vived. And so if we're ever going to experience revival, we all got to make sure we're vived. And so maybe this week is a time for you to stop, to position yourself before the Lord to shut out every distraction, and to listen. Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. Would you pray with me? Father, today we are so thankful for this wonderful account of how your Son, our Savior, worked in the lives of these individuals. The matters of life were real. The grief was real, but Lord, you called them deeper. You called them further. You called them to deal with lordship. And so today, let me again echo the words of Jesus. Do you believe? That is, in fact, the question we all must deal with. Do we believe? It doesn't matter what Brother Mark believes. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what our friends and our family believe. What matters is whether or not we believe you are the Christ and whether you are our Savior and Lord. And so, Father, today, for the one who does not yet know you as Savior, I pray you'd speak clearly into their heart that they need to know you. Perhaps, Lord, there's a Christian here but they are bound by something that keeps them distracted and discouraged and prevents them from enjoying the freedom that is ours in you. Lord, would you help all of us to hear you today? Not the distractions of this world. Not the fear of what others may think. God, would you help us to hear from you as you say, that you love us so much you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. So, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, speak to every heart in this place today that we would be still and know what you're calling us to and away from. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.